Kerwin Ray, welcome to Dad's World. Thank you, Leroy. An absolute honour and a pleasure to be here. Mate, first of all, it's a very, very easy question. Uh, so let's get this out of the way first. What's the yeah, best? What's what's the best thing about being a dad? Oh, mate, like for me personally, my, my journey's been an interesting one. Like uh, my parents split up when I was like six months old. I didn't have a, a very strong presence of a father figure in my life, and so for me, you know, I was always always desiring something that wasn't there. And you know, by about the age of fourteen, when I realised I probably wasn't going to get the dad that I wanted in this uh, in this in this round in this life, I started to really clearly define the type of dad that I wanted to be. Um, and as a result, you know, I, I created this designer dad kind of profile and not in an unrealistic kind of way. I just thought, okay, how do I want to be, what kind of a dad would I have wanted to have? And I'm not kidding, like this happened when I was about 14. And so the best thing about being, being a dad for me is I get to be a, the father that I always wanted to my own son. And in a way, I'm, I'm parenting myself a, a little bit as well. And so although I'm being, a, an, you know, what I believe is an incredible dad for my son, um, I'm also reparenting myself, which is incredibly cathartic as well. Isn't that amazing? You know, we sort of sit back and we have a look at how our, our parents, you know, dealt with things and, and the, their parenting strategies and all that sort of stuff. And there's certain elements you just sort of want to steer away from. Are there any elements for you, I know I've got a couple, but are any elements for you where I go, you know what, that was a real great trait uh, of my parents, I'm going to hang on to that and I'm going to sort of bring that one forward? Yeah, look, my mum was really affectionate, you know, she she was always giving us kisses, always giving us cuddles, was telling us that she loved us a hundred times a day, you know, sleeping in her bed was never a question of do you want to, it was an expectation and so, yeah, she just allowed us, she just really blessed us with an enormous amount of affection um, and I'll be forever grateful and as a result, you know, I'm an incredibly affectionate person myself and with my son, it's exactly the same, you know, I, I tell him I love him a hundred times a day, I'm constantly cuddling and kissing him because I know there's probably going to be at some point where I go to give him a cuddle and a kiss and he's going to go, Dad, please get away. So uh, I'm just making the most of it. These are your words out of one of your podcasts just recently. If you want to be the best parent in the world, you've got to be willing to deal with a ton of pain because you've got to sit there in the storm yes. of meltdowns. Yes. You've got to be present. You've got to be calm and not allow them to push your buttons, mate. That's easier said than done. How do you do this? Well, mate, you've got to look at the higher picture and why you do this, you know, because a lot of people don't understand the implications of our reactions to children when they're in high stress situations. And what I mean by this is when a child is having a meltdown, they're in pain. They feel unsafe. And it just could have been because you took away their toy. It could have been because they kicked their toe or they fell off their bike. When a child starts to melt down, you know, we call it they flip their lid. And that's actually quite a literal term. You know, the frontal lobes of their brain literally disconnect from, you know, the mammalian part of their brain and, and they stop communicating. They become completely irrational. But what we need to understand is in those irrational moments, they feel very unsafe. And what they need is they need, they need a point of stability. And it's in those moments where if they don't get that point of stability, they don't learn how to regulate. Because what they do is when they're upset, they look to us. And if they're upset and then we lose our, you know, we toss our noodles out and we get upset at them for being upset, all they're looking for is something that's not moving. They're looking for something that's solid. And if they can't find it, then they don't learn and they're not demonstrated how to calm down properly. So when a child is melting down, what they need is they need a calm parent to just say, look, through demonstration of my physiology right now, I'm calm, you're not. But as long as you can see that I'm calm, eventually you're going to calm down. And that process actually teaches kids how to regulate. It teaches them how to deal with not only pain, it teaches them how to deal with high levels of emotion, it also teaches them how to deal with stress. But when we rebuttal against that, if we, you know, if we attack against that, not only do they not learn how to deal with stress, their brain actually starts to maladapt to the environment because they don't know how to regulate in healthy ways. And so their brain looks for different ways to regulate, which often can change the dopamine profile of a, de of a, of a developing brain. And now if you do that consistently over an extended period of time, you've essentially got a brain that works differently to you know, what would be called what, neurotypical. And that can bring out traits such as ADHD, it can increase the probability for things like addiction and an addiction is a spectrum there's low level addictions such as you know people you know wanting to shop and use social media and there's high level addictions which is you know quite self abusive and involves half drugs and self harm but understanding the importance of being calm in that storm and having that higher perspective and realizing that you know I may want to yell at my child right now because he's annoying the absolute you know the, the nut out of me but if I take the higher road here, I'm going to increase the probability of by the time my child is 17, 18, 19, he's going to be a very happy, healthy, independent, stable, 
you know, young adult that is going to be less likely to go into troubled paths because he's learned how to regulate himself. Because with most kids, they don't learn how to regulate. They get to 15, 16, 17, they get introduced to alcohol. All of a sudden, their dopamine profile starts to balance out. They get floods of dopamine. And it's for, oftentimes, it's the first time in their life where I go, wow, I actually feel really good mm. because they've got this burst of dopamine. Whereas it's our job is to show them how to regulate naturally so that their brains can equalize you know, their, their chemical profile naturally without having to use substance expect to get this personal on the podcast but I'm about to I I'm a quite a short tempered person and yep. you know uh, all of my life it's it's just been that way and I I think it's come down a little bit of learnt behavior from my grandfather he was quite short tempered as well loved yep. loved him to pieces he was a great influence in certain areas but very very short tempered and now I'm fearing that my kids might get a little bit that way as well as we you know as as they said I mean they're 13 and 17 now and there's Early stages and early signs that they may, you know, be a little short-tempered. Have we gone too far or can we peg that back? Pass down wisdom, not wounds. Like whatever we, whatever behaviours our children see, they will adopt. And, and I, I, there's never been more responsibility required than there is right now because there's never been so much information available. You know, it was just the other day I was, I was yelling at my cat. You know, I've got this wild Bengal of a cat and I was yelling at him because he's just never satisfied. He's always hungry and he scratches crap up. And I yelled at the cat because he was misbehaving and then I walked away. And then like 20 minutes later, the cat started scratching something again. And then I heard my son yell in exactly the same tonality, in exactly the same way, using exactly the same words. And I was just like, wow, he is doing everything that I am doing. And it just reminded me of the importance of responsibility, but also understanding that a, that a human brain doesn't fully mature until their late 20s. And so it doesn't matter how old your child is, you know, they could be 14 or 15, but as long as we still, you know, dedicate ourselves to providing a role model and providing an environment that is safe and demonstrating actions that are healthy and that we would like to see repeated there's always hope you know and even beyond that you know i think there's hope but you know because neuroplasticity is something that we're learning a lot more about now but i do think parents need to understand the responsibility that is involved with bringing up a child is they are they are either going to pass down their, their good behaviors or their bad behaviors or both. But you've got to ask, ask yourself the question, you know, what kind of a world are we trying to create here? And it's not about not passing down any wounds to your children because you know, they've got to learn how to develop resilience. They've got to learn how to deal with you know, you know, certain levels of pain and stress as well. But it's learning how to mitigate that as much as possible so that they have the greatest chance for success. As a, and by success, I mean a happy, healthy child that isn't subject to negative behaviors or, or compulsive behaviors. You want to be a winner at home. You also want to be a winner at work as well. One of the hardest things... Uh, uh, for dads to deal with these days, I reckon is work-life balance. Have, oh crap! Yeah. Have you got a silver bullet for that, Kerwin? Or <laughs> no, I don't. But I have a strategy, um, and that is wherever I am, I'm present to that moment. And you know, so when I'm with my son, I'm with my son, and he's got a very deep cup. You know, because it's always about trying to fill their cup up as much as possible whenever we're with them. But there's this little thing called attunement, because you can be with your child, but if you're not present, they feel it. And by present, I mean, you are connected. You are looking at them. You're looking, when you're talking to them, you're looking in their eyes and they can feel that connection. And that attunement actually affects how their brains develop as well. So if you aren't attuned to your child, you might be in the same room as your child, but if you're either on your phone or they're watching TV, they're not actually connected to you. And as a result of that, their brain actually starts to maladapt. And so one of the things that's very important for me is that when I'm with my son, I'm with my son. And it doesn't mean that I don't check my phone from time to time. I do, but I often try and put my phone in another room and I'm present with him. And when I'm at work, I'm present at work. And so, you know, for me, I'm constant, because I'm a single dad, Mm -hmm. And I, I have a nanny, but I, I, I don't have, you know, I have a cleaner that comes once a fortnight, but I do the washing, the cooking, the cleaning, plus I'm running a, you know, a, a, a multi eight figure business at a very high level that's a global brand. So I understand the, the demands. My mum did it with two kids and I'm like, how the hell did she do this? But what I also understand is it's possible, you know, but what it comes down to is what our priorities are. And if your priorities are being, you know, about helping create a happy, healthy, you know, independent child, then you've got to understand you need to prioritize presence when you're with your children, when you're with your team, with whatever it is that you're doing. Um, so I'll, I'm not sure I'm ever going to find, you know, total balance because I always feel guilty about something. I always feel guilty about not being completing everything I, you know, that I need to do at the work that day. I always feel guilty that I didn't get to spend an extra 10 minutes playing remote control cars with my son in the morning. I always feel guilty that, you know, I'm trying to get my, you know, my son to bed sometimes on time instead of, you know, spending an extra 10 minutes reading books. But at the, the time that I do spend, I make sure it's as present as possible. Dads tend to have a, a go-to habit. So when things aren't going all that well for them, like for example, for me, it's it's I have uh, 
an interesting relationship with the Colonel, Colonel Sanders. And, uh, <laughs> you know, whenever things aren't going my way, if I have this, I'll feel better sort of attitude. How do you, how do you get past that as a dad? Well, you know, as a dad, I'm an addict. So, you know, I became addicted to um, amphetamines when I was younger. And, you know, I've identified as someone who needs to be very careful of substance because I have that personality and that nature. And so for me, you know, when, when things aren't going well, my first re- response is to, you know, reach for something sugary or to reach for something fatty or to order a pe- like a pizza. You know, I'm, I'm very blessed that, you know, my, my addictions right now are at a much healthier level than what they've been in the past. But it's about doing the work on yourself. And, and this is what's really important. Like when you remove, when, when you have stress, it brings stuff to the surface. So, you know, if you're in an intimate relationship or if you're a parent or if you're in a high pressure job, like whenever you're stressed, whatever your issues that are underlying, it's gonna come to the surface. Because when, when life is good, our issues don't typically appear. It's only when things are going wrong mm. that our issues actually come to the surface. But, and people think that's bad. They go, oh, when I'm stressed, I behave just in like a, a, you know, a completely different person. That's not bad. That's an opportunity. Because because when things are going well and that you know that short temper comes to the t- to the surface that gives us the opportunity to reflect and go okay what's underlying here what what is the wound here that i need to work on that's going to enable me to deal with this in healthier ways and run, and run, re- and replace this you know this compulsive behavior rather than with, than with a short temper how do i replace that with compassion and curiosity but it's not until we start looking at these triggers it's not until we start looking at our wounds and our issues as points of opportunity rather than things that we should be ashamed and embarrassed of and try and hide and prevent and not let other people see that we actually get the opportunity to do the work that's required to become healthy ourselves because we are a product of our parenting and mm. whatever issues that we have unfortunately most of them have come from our parents you know and they did the best that they could and we're doing the best that we could but we can always do better do you know what I mean? And by doing the work on ourselves, it gives us the opportunity to not just do better for ourselves, but also do better for our kids, which is the next generation. And you know, right now, and I'm not kidding, it's the future of our planet. And it's not even the future of our planet, it's the future of our species. Our planet's gonna be fine. You know, right now it's treating us like an infection. It's gonna burn up and you know, likely get rid of us. And it will you know, essentially come back and be quite healthy. But our species really is dependent right now on a new generation of thought leaders coming through who are healthy, who are happy, who are balanced, who can look at things in a more conscious way and make better decisions than some of the decisions we're making right now collectively. You talk a lot about this in your conferences and in your podcasts and stuff like that. Leaders are always you know, uh, on the edge to provide a sense of security uh, during uncertain times. That's our job. Yes. That's our role. I Absolutely. I feel that dads need to do the same thing, but is there any room here for our kids to start learning lessons like, well... It doesn't always work out the way you want it to, or it's okay to lose and stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's a great, you know, the greatest leadership role you ever had of is one as a parent. But like, let's contrast that against um, being a leader in a business or an organization or a team for a moment. Imagine if you were leading a team and one of your team members did something wrong and you scolded them and you sent them to a corner, Mm. you know, or you scolded them and you smacked them on the bum or you sent (laughs) them to their room. Like your team would be like, what the hell, bro? What the, what's going on? You know, and so we need to understand the way we discipline our children is a leadership function. And it's really important that we understand, yes, as leaders, what our children need is they need a, they, they, they need a point of stability. When things go wrong, who does everybody look to? They look to the leader. And so when things go wrong for a child, they're typically in meltdown. They're going to look to, okay, who is the strongest, most centered person in the room? And that's where it's important as parents to, to understand Children don't trust emotional adults because emotional adults are unpredictable and unpredictable is unsafe. And so what children will trust is they'll trust adults that when the, when the things are going wrong, the adult who stays calm, the adult who stays assertive, not the pushover adult, the adult who stays calm, assertive and maintains proper boundaries. Okay, because what that teaches them to do is, when I'm unsure, where do I go to? Because if you want to build trust with your child so that they come and talk to you when they're 14, 15 years old and they're going through puberty and they've got things like you know, drugs and alcohol and boys and girls coming in, you need to create an environment when they are uncertain, when they are unsteady, that they know that they can come to you and you're not going to lose your cracker. Okay, But at the same time, as leaders, it's our job, whether it's in a team or a parenting role, to help them understand what failure really is. You know, because the reason that so many people fear failure is because when we failed as children, oftentimes our parents say, well, well, what did you do that for? Why did you make that mistake? Why did you fail that test? Rather than going, oh, wow, okay, you failed that test. What did you learn from that? What is the work that we need to do? What things have we done? And again, so counterintuitive, but when you think about it from the perspective of the way, the way adults treat failure is about the way that they've been taught. And failure 
you know, as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, I understand is critical to success. If you ain't failing, you ain't learning. And if your success, success is a poor teacher, but unfortunately for kids, we've got to show them that the key to becoming happy and healthy is not just failing, but learning how to regulate the stress that comes up, learning how to regulate the emotion that comes up, but learning how to reframe the perspective that when failure happens, that we don't sit there and set, become mopey and depressed, that we look at it and go, wow, dad, I failed. You know, what did I learn from this? You know, what skills, knowledge and experience do I now have that I didn't have yet? Yesterday, and how can I use this experience to be a better, you know, better at my hundred meter race or better at my spelling bee or whatever it is? You know, we've got to get kids to become excited about making mistakes so that they can look at it as a learning opportunity rather than looking at it as an opportunity for them to be, you know, made out to be wrong or shamed or, or, or feel made to feel guilty because they're not enough. Absolutely, Kerwin. Right, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this podcast. There is one more question before we just break, though. Yeah, fire. And that is, uh, I'm going to give you the stage here. I mean, you've had it for about 20 minutes or so, but I'm going to give you the stage here, and I'm going to say to you, you can give one piece of advice to dads that are listening, not only around Australia, but right around the world now. What would that piece of advice be? Develop a high level of self-awareness. You know, focus on your self-awareness. Focus on your journey. And the reason I say you first is because, you know, in the event of an emergency, they say put the oxygen mask on you first because if you pass out, you're no help to anyone else. And as a parent, especially as a single parent, you know, I often find myself running, running around, running myself ragged to the point where I'm so exhausted that you know, I'm not able to take care of myself, let alone anyone else in some situations. You know, and as a parent, our, the greatest opportunity our kids have is by learning through the best example that we can give them and by learning how to, you know, teaching them how to deal with things you know, that, in healthy ways. And the way that we do that is because, by becoming more conscious by becoming more self-conscious, by becoming more self-aware so that we can become conscious of what our triggers are, we can become conscious of what our shortfalls are, we can become conscious of what our strengths are so that we can actually utilize not just our strengths but also our weaknesses in healthy ways to demonstrate behaviors that are going to give our kids the greatest opportunity for becoming happy, healthy, independent, bigger people. I fear, I honestly feel like I've just been to a conference listening to you. You are unbelievable, <laughs> mate. Thanks so Thank much. You. Thanks so much for being a part of the podcast and, uh, you know, for educating us dads because, look, we're just dads trying to be better dads and the way to do that is talk to other dads that are doing it as well. That's it. And if my final piece of advice is, you know, we're, remember we're always doing the best that we can with the skills that we've got, but we can always do better. And it's not about from a guilt or a shamey perspective, but it's from a curiosity curiosity perspective from a standards perspective set a bigger standard set a higher standard be the best dad the best mum you can be but just aim every day to be a little bit better